All right, well, why don't we get started? Um, I wanna welcome everyone to this afternoon's talks, Bee Friendly Gardening, and then the ACT's first library of things. First, uh, an acknowledgement of country. On behalf of all of us, I want to thank the traditional owners of this land we are meeting on today for their care of country over thousands of years and to pay my respects to their elders past and emerging. So the first talk this afternoon will be given, given by Julie Armstrong from ACT for Bees. Julie has been involved in Rudolf Steiner education for over 20 years. In 2014, she learned about the global bee crisis and started ACT for Bees a group to promote ways to support the health and well-being of bees in the Australian Capital Territory and the region. ACT for Bees is working towards making the ACT bee friendly by collaborating with local schools, government, land developers, community groups to create pollinator corridors and reduce pesticide use for the health of pollinators and of all life. So we'll turn it over now to, um, to Julie and looking forward to this talk. What Thank a great you. background. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Well, <laughs> we'll see, I think hopefully the so thank you so much for inviting me to join you. And uh, I'm just gonna share my screen. There we are, that's it, good. Okay, so first of all, acknowledgement to country. I would also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and send my gratitude to the elders past, present and future for their care of country for so many thousands of years. So we're a local education group focused on the importance of planting for pollinators in our schools, our gardens, businesses and streetscapes. Now, let me just find out, this is where I need to go. Okay, so these are just a few of the um, our local native bees that we might see in our gardens. This one is quite common. And if you've got holes in your rose leaves like this, it's very likely you have leaf cutter bees that are cutting these to make their cocoons to lay their eggs. The blue banded bees are um, starting to emerge. Um, they're quite large, they're very big, um, they're quite big and buzzy. So they really sound a little bit like, um, uh, and they buzz pollinate. These are reed bees, tiny little ones, um, but amazing. They've got this red orange um, and it's often like an arrow on the back. The carpenter bee, the green carpenter bee, the great green carpenter, green metallic carpenter bee is actually found in Canberra and it's, um, it's on the in, in, of, um, endangered species list. So it's a very important um, bee. And they were really looking at, um, they were saving this endangered um, bee on Kangaroo Island. And unfortunately, that particular area got burnt. So our, our in, ours in Canberra are really important. Now the teddy bear bee, we think they're around, but um, they, haven't, they haven't really been sighted, but apparently they're here in Canberra. They haven't been cited by Peter Abbott. So Peter Abbott is our local bee expert who has spent many hours looking at flowers in the botanic gardens in the Australian National Botanic Gardens. And because it is all natives, we have this amazing range of native bees. And this really is extraordinary. We've got, um, a, a, he thinks they're probably 200, but um, you know, he thinks he, 150 have been um, located in the last, you know, five years. So it's really an amazing project. Um, and this is on our website. Um, it's a, basically a cheat list. Obviously, we can't go in there at the minute, but soon we will. And this is the time when the native bees are starting to emerge. So we all know about the honeybees. They are very different in that they live in very big colonies. So um, the queen bee and then up to 50, 60,000 maiden female bees and a couple of thousand drones at the peak of the season. 
So most of the bees in, in a honeybee hive are females. Now they go out really um, half of the hive are, are foraging and the rest of them are inside the hive caring, um, basically feeding the brood, the, the, um, the baby bees. Um, they're just like a butterfly, they go through stages. So it starts off at an egg and then goes through a larva and then the larva develops, it's fed lots um, bee bread. And then finally it spins a cocoon um, when it's in this wax cell. And then that's where the amazing transformation happens just like a caterpillar into a butterfly. It's like a caterpillar into a bee. When she emerges, she starts um, work immediately. She becomes a cleaner bee and then she becomes a nurse bee looking after the brood. She might look after the queen, feed the queen, keep the, the hive at the constant temperature, 35 degrees Celsius, um, transform the, the honey, the nectar that comes in into honey um, and uh, also um, bu building, so building the wax. At, at about 12 days old, they start to secrete wax from their abdomen and then they become builder bees. But at 21 days old, they become soldier bees. So they're guarding the entrance to the hive. And then at about 24 days, that's when they go out into the world, into the light. It's always, it's in the darkness before to go and forage nectar and pollen to feed, to keep the hive alive. So the nectar is transformed into honey and the pollen is um, used for bee bread. And of course, when they, pollen, they pollinate, they travel from, from flower to flower. This would be just going between strawberry flowers. And the pollen from one flower is transformed onto another flower. And that's where the amazing pollination happens. And this is what is so important for our world. And this is the beginning of the strawberry. Each of those tiny little dots actually has to be pollinated. So it's not just one visit by bees, it's, it's many, many. With bees, amazing abundance and um, the, our most nutritious food is, is thanks to pollination um, to bees. And this is without. So it's quite remarkable how many of our most nutritious foods are relying. And, you know, you say, well, why would carrots need um, pollinators to produce seeds for the next generation? So the cucumbers, um, you know, apples, apples, 100% dependent. Um, almonds, 100% dependent on, on um, pollinators. So it would be a very boring life without them. So this is what you often see at the end of the season, very small misshapen cucumbers. Some people even hand pollinate their, um, their um, pumpkins because to make sure they're properly pollinated. So as you can see, eight to 20 visits per bee. And what happens, you know, if it's poorly pollinated, they actually don't come out um, well, and it isn't saleable for a farmer. So it's not just us that relies, relies on pollination. This is basically um, a picture of of um, our ecosystem, our local ecosystem. You know, we've got the galahs and the ringtailed possums and the king parrots and, you know, the black cockatoos and eastern spinebills and then all of these different um, um, marsupials and mammals and, and also um, reptiles. And they rely, really the pollinators are keystone species. When you start to take out keystone species, the numbers start to reduce because the seeds that they eat um, are not, um, there, there isn't enough food. But not only that, many of these species, um, these insectivorous, um, the ones that, that eat insects also need a certain number of insects in, in the um, ecosystem to feed. And particularly at this time of year, they feed kilos to their nestlings until they um, fledge. So having insects in our gardens is really important. It's really about having balance in the ecosystem. And then it starts to flow on to other animals. So, you know, that's when we see biodiversity loss. So again, just showing you the blue banded bees. These are the males hanging around on stalks. Um, they are solitary. Most of our native bees are actually solitary. They live in the ground. There's one of them. These blue banded bees seem to live in sorts of colonies. They live singly, but they live together like they have their own little unit. And the males hang around on these stalks at evening and they're waiting for the females to emerge to, um, to mate with them. Oops. Um, these are the cuckoo bees. 
Um, and these coexist with the blue banded bees. Oh they actually lay their eggs in the blue banded bees' um, nests. Um, and then their young um, develop, eat the food that was for the, um, the blue banded bees. So these are amazing, absolutely beautiful looking bees, checkered cuckoo bees. Um, and if you've got blue banded bees, you're very likely to have um, the cuckoo bees. And they often are seen more around the autumn time. And these are the leaf cutter bees I was talking about before. They love the soft rose bushes, but also buddleia. Um, and this is a, a, a cocoon that has got the eggs. Um, and what they do is they lay the female eggs first and then the male um, at the end. And um, the males emerge first. And if, you know, if we build bee hotels and they're not long enough, they actually don't lay the male eggs. So that's one of the issues with badly made bee hotels that most that you see in the shops are not deep enough. I'll talk about that later. So this is this beautiful um, leaf cutter bee and they've got this yellow underneath the scopa and it's, that's what collects the pollen. They're really fantastic pollinators and they're very um, often in our gardens. Now these are the reed bees and you see them in our, our national um, ACT floral emblem, the Wallen Bergia that are starting to come out. So they're very small, but it is really worth looking in Wallen Bergia when you see them, even by the side of the road, there may be a tiny little bee there. Um, but they often um, like pithy stems. So um, all sorts of different, um, even canes from um, raspberries, um, from um, agapanther stems are great for just making your own bee hotels. So lots of threats, lots of problems. Climate change, of course, is affecting all things. Increased urbanisation, you know, loss of habitat putting concrete over their holes that have often had generations of, of bees, but you know, the native bees, intensive farming, high chemical use, um, but also loss of biodiversity and pests and diseases. Um, so we're really about taking action. Um, the bee friendly garden is something, a pollinator friendly garden is really planting um, a range of plants that will flower throughout the year. Um, we've got wonderful spring flowering, but it's often in the summer that it's really difficult to, um, to have um, a lot of forage for them and that's when they really need it because the nests are built up, the hives build up, there's lots and lots of bees to feed and they need food. Um, the heirloom varieties, the older varieties have got much um, richer sources of nectar and pollen. A shallow bowl of water um, with stones in is really great, keep it clean um, and keep it topped up, that's also good different levels of these um, water sources not only for bees but for birds in different places in, in, um, in shrubs, but also out in the open. So the big birds will go to the ones out in the open and the little, the smaller ones that are much more vulnerable, you know, can be in the um, hanging from a tree somewhere. Good soil management, really avoiding all the nasties. Um, wherever you can buy organic seeds and seedlings, because a lot of the seeds are actually covered in um, um, fungicides. And it's actually the mixture of fungicides and pesticides that are particularly toxic for um, for bees. Um, and it's also in our agriculture supporting really good, well grown food. Um, and that's one of the things that we can do three times a day at least because we all eat. And also join us. So, encouraging really good biodiversity in our garden. Um, these are, you know, obviously the, the ladybirds are fantastic at um, eating the aphids. Um, hoverflies are around, they're often um, misidentified as a native bee, but they're, they hover um, and they've got these very clear stripes on their back, um, quite clear patterns. Sometimes they're quite black, but you see them, you know, they're native. Um, we've also got wonderful range of wasps and um, really they won't attack you unless they're, they're, they're good to have. They really keep the insects down, the, the, um, the problem insects. Lace wings and praying mantises are fantastic. So we've got a really, really amazing website. I have to say, we've got lots and lots of information and tips. Um, this gardening for bees is basically, you go to our homepage and you go to resources and you'll click down and gardening for bees will be fairly up the top. And this second part, we've got the act for bees fly, which is just very general tips, but this planting for bees and native bees is um, our new, um, uh, um, 
plant list that has been updated by um, Meredith Cosgrove, who is, oh, we're so grateful for her joining our group because she's a plant expert. And um, so again, just um, ideas about what colors, um, bees love blue, purple, yellow and white. Um, and there's also nectar guides that are ultraviolet light. We actually can't see them, but when you look at them under ultraviolet light, you can see these guides that actually go into the middle of the flower, which is where the nectar is. Um, and then we're also looking at butterflies. So, oops, sorry. Um, so different butterflies like the red, orange, pink and white flowers. So they often are at different times. It's also interesting just to see, you know, the honeybees are on the flowers at one time and then the native bees at a different time. It's just good to watch what's going on. Oh, there we are. Oh no, this has changed. Um, so this is, uh, you know, just uh, um, the first page of, um, of our new plant list. We've got colored photos, which are just fantastic. Um, it's been really well done. And a, a lot of really great, you know, local natives. These chrysophilias, oh, sorry, paper daisies just come in so many different varieties um, and they're wonderful for native bees, uh, all sorts. The brachisome, the cut leaf daisies, the daisies are fantastic. Um, I often find native bees on them in, in the botanic gardens. Um, the different sorts of corias, lots of nectar there, dampiera. Um, blue flax lilies, they're, they're out at the moment. Beautiful to see up on um, Black Mountain. And the um, goodenia species are also coming out too. So, and these just really are a general, you know, guide. Obviously, if you've got room, eucalypts are fantastic because they have so many flowers. Um, and at the moment, there's so many, so many eucalypts in flowers, particularly the, um, the yellow box and... Um, up on um, Coolerman Ridge near where we live are just uh, so many bees in them. The bottle brush are great because you've got a variety of colours and they often flower twice during the season. So you can have just a gradual, um, slightly different colours and there'll be a succession of flowering. They're also um, good for birds as well. Um, paper bark, so again, lots of pollen and nectar. Banksies, of course, are really fantastic and they're particularly good in the winter. Um, and they've, they, they have lots and lots of nectar. Tea trees are really, um, as Monica honey was really from the tea tree. And the grevilleas are great bird food as well. So the tea trees are just starting to come out now. Corias, um, nice deep flowers, as you saw. Um, coastal rosemary are fantastic. That's where I've seen um, the, the um, cuckoo bees. Hardened Bergia, they're often the first to come out. Um, and I actually saw a whole lot of native bees up on Black Mountain. Um, we had a very warm, hot day in, in early September and I was so surprised. I saw about five different species. And then it snowed the next day. It was like, oh my goodness, what, what's gonna happen to those bees? So I've been back once and didn't see them again. So you know, I just hope they weren't just out too early. Daisies of all sorts um, and chocolate lilies, lilies are coming out as the vanilla lilies and also the, um, there's another yellow one. So these are um, really herbs that all of us can grow even on balconies, um, you know, on in apartments. Um, probably borage you wouldn't want on a, on a balcony, but um, borage is absolutely brilliant for bees. Um, it Apparently it releases nectar every you know, half a minute to a minute. So it's very, very busy. Um, sage of all sorts, um, salvias, um, all sorts of different um, colours and um, perennial basil. Now this is much more difficult in Canberra because they are frost sensitive, but it is absolutely fantastic because um, it starts flowering inside. We have a couple of pots of it inside and I take cuttings. And then I, um, Put it out now it's outside and it, it's flowering already it'll flower until it gets done by frost or i bring it in just you know at the end the end of autumn lavender with all the different um species successive flowering mint let it flower and again rosemary is particularly good over the winter so um a bellier is um really high nectar um as i said the salvia is buddleia is fantastic for the butterflies a whole range of butterflies if you've got room Calendula is a really good um, companion plant in the garden. Now dandelions often get a very bad name, but actually they are fantastic at mining 
minerals deep in the soil and bringing them up to the surface. So they're actually really, really good at um, taking care of bringing our soil back. And often these weeds are often seen as a problem, but actually they're really beneficial. They're bringing things into balance up on the top. These sea sour daisies are just extraordinary in the number of species that are, um, they attract. You know, that some, they'll have all sorts of different moths, butterflies, different sorts of bees, um, praying mantis, little tiny wasps, really quite amazing. So worth having, you know, they're great um, fillers. So this is um, our verge garden, um, looks a bit wild, bit un, um, I've actually left a lot of this grass is actually the, the ends of wild and Bergia from last season. And I just wanted to keep um, a cover over the ground so it didn't dry out, even you know, with all the rain. It's just really good to have a cover. But these are just a whole lot of different, you know, with the dandelions, a whole lot of these are billy buttons, all different sorts of daisies. Um, I've got the seaside daisies, two or three speed, um, at the back. And, and, um, and then we've got hakea. So really easy, and Wallenbergia down the front, really easy to have um, pollinators. Now, one of the things is that the native bees really do have a foraging distance of up to 500 metres, quite different to honeybees that can actually travel up to 10 kilometres if they're hungry. Now, they won't do that if they're not, if there's food locally. But this is why we actually need to be having, um, you know, we call them pollinator networks now. It's really creating spots in our gardens, on our nature strips, um, in our schools to feed the pollinators. Of course, yeah. So we've been working um, with um, Gin and Dairy, the developers in West Belconnen, um, to, to create pollinator networks. Um, and to do that, we actually needed to um, add to the ACT government urban um, plant species, which are plant, plants that are put into the, um, into the streetscapes. Um, and so we added um, flowering times, nectar pollen, seed resources and type of forager. And it's a very, very comprehensive list of plants that have survived with very little care. Well worth looking at. It, we've got links on our website um, to find it easily. Um, and it's also got Ngunnawal um, cultural use on it now too. So um, from that, um, Gin and Dairy is actually now um, planting in the, the second um, stage. They're actually planting every 200 metres, 200 metre grids <coughs> of flowers for pollinators. So we're just so excited. Um, from the ACT government list, we're actually made something which is still being um, worked on. It's, it's just going through comms, ACT government comms, but it's something that we can all use um, really much easier. It's got the, um, the common name as well. It doesn't have all the information that developers need um, and it's got the flowering time. So you can really easily see, you know, this would be good. Um, obviously the bunya punya pine is rather large for our gardens, but um, there are, I should have done actually, um, sorry, shrubs I'll, I'll change that to a, a more useful page for most people um, so it's actually 28 pages of um, tree shrubs ground covers and grasses and the grasses are actually really important for butterflies um, so it's it's interesting you know part of their life cycle is on needing grasses so um, yeah I was a bit oh you know no flowering times for, for, for grasses but finding more and more so these, um, this was um, a, a bee hotel that Peter Abbott made, um, and it's particularly good for leaf cutter bees. He's got these straws in it, um, so it makes it very easy to clean. Um, so this is actually brewed in there. Um, this was actually quite a while ago. This is actually an amazing wasp. It's really, really long, um, and this is a this is actually a leaf cutter bee. It's quite you can see this it's quite small so he has different sized holes as you can see um, these are actually special drills um, so it's not our normal drills you need to get special drills um, particularly really difficult and they need to be sharp um, if you want to make it yourself because if this is jagged it actually tears the wings as the as the bees come out so they have to be really carefully made. Bamboo's great um, if they don't have the nodules in between, otherwise they're too small. 
So I've been collecting agapanthers. It's great. Um, actually, the fennel stalks from last season are great. Um, there's a whole lot of different um, uh, models down at the ACT beekeepers down at Canberra City Farm that Peter's been experimenting with just to see what will work. Um, and, you know, straws do too. So it's, it's just good. So again, Pollinator Link up in Brisbane, has um, they're creating pollinator corridors and he's got some great resources which he's shared with us very kindly. And as I said before, water is important um, for all. And yeah, obviously the cats are, watch out for the cats. So um, really we're working towards be um, pollinator friendly, be <laughs> pollinator friendly Canberra where the government promotes bee-friendly practices. So they are, they've actually removed their most toxic pesticides and neonicotinoids. Often um, Comfidor and those um, are very, very toxic and have been banned um, in um, Europe. That was one of the things that started us off. Um, we have a very um, comprehensive list of neonics being used in Australia. Um, integrated pesticide management use is a really great example of that is what's been done at Parliament House. Um, they don't use any pesticides. Um, they use, um, yeah, it's wonderful. It's really worth if you can never get a, a um, on, um, oh goodness, sorry. World Bee Day um, in May, May the 20th. Um, they often have tours of Parliament House with the um, grounds people. We wanted accurate plant. That's going to be much more difficult being pollinator friendly plants, but this is something that we're doing um, and pollinator corridors or networks and the education is what, if anyone's interested in, in joining us, we're very happy. Um, so um, yes, that's, oh, that's good. <laughs> good. I wasn't quite sure of the time. Um, so really, um, we're starting to work with Rotary um, and Rotary clubs um, will be working with creating pollinated networks within schools. Um, our local with Hall Village was the first bee friendly village in Australia. Um, so we're really excited because um, it's just amazing to have um, a group that is so um, organised and has people everywhere. There's a um, Rotary group in Melbourne, Rotary for Bees, and uh, we're really looking at creating pollinator networks all the way from Melbourne right up, um, right up. So our local region will have um, many, as well as farms. Um, we've got really great resources with the We Bean Foundation on creating pollinator corridors or networks on farms and planting. So, yes. Okay, great. thank you. That's great, Julie. Thank you very much. There's a lot of information there. I think we'll all have to go to the website to uh, to brush up on what you've said. So, could I? Sorry, just one more thing is yep. we actually created curriculum. So, if anyone oh. is a teacher, we've got Love Food, Love Bees. It's online, free to download, and it's actually been used by half a million students in Australia. It's been very popular, and it's got lots on native bees as well. So again, that's on our website. That's great. Okay. Yes, for all those people that, um, well, I mean, I suppose the homeschooling, you've got the, you've got uh, another, another piece of curriculum to use for all those. That's great. So um, let me see, I've got to, I've got to change my thing around here. Um, so have, have we got, have we got anyone who has questions? Put your hand up and uh, we'll take questions. Well, I have a question. Now, I, I, uh, I think I failed from what you said. I, I went to, um, let's see, probably Aldi and got one of their B hotels. Now, um, is there anything I can do to modify this so that it sounds like it, it sounds like it's pretty useless mm -hmm. and where, sh and where should I put it? That's the other question. Once oh. I get it in shape. <laughs> um, if you have a good bee hotel, put it in an east facing position um, with, uh, you know, shade from the Western sun, but they like the, the, the morning sun. Uh, and look, you haven't failed. It's just, it's education. Nobody knows. Of course, you know, these bee hotels look are really, you know, lovely. They look great. And oh, they think, do. Oh, yeah, they do look good. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really is, we're all learning. 
So um, unfortunately, they're, no, they're really no use. <laughs> How deep did you say they had to be? Um, 15 centimetres. So half a ruler. So about, you know, about that, that deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, it, this information is on our website. Go to our website and you'll find that information, um, particularly in the Australian native bee section. Um, and uh, yeah. Any other Great. questions? Well, that sounds one. Uh, Dorothy, Dorothy has a question. I have a question from, um, from Bronnie. Uh, it's, uh, do you think that keeping honeybees in hives in the, in the garden would be detrimental to the native bees? <laughs> Look, um, we we've started off with being, you know, starting off with honeybees, and now we're learning about native bees. And the main thing is, you have food for them. And really, for me, it's really actually deepening our relationship with nature. And if you take care of your bees and you develop in this relationship, what better way to really be grateful for the honey and not take too much? Um, that you really have a sense of this is where my honey comes from. Um, but also you're providing food for, for, for the bees and, and for other. So the main thing is I say, look, you know, if you don't, if you're thinking about getting a hive, just like you would a dog, you wouldn't expect your neighbor to feed them. Make sure you've got food before you get a hive. So that's the biggest thing. And you do a beekeeping course. So you know, you know, pests and diseases are really the um, ACT beekeeper is a fantastic group to join. Um, they're all sorts of different speakers and really great teaching. They've got great courses, but they've also got that great meetings where they um, have got beginners corner at the beginning, and you can ask the most stupid questions, and everybody's been there. So <laughs> strongly advise you to do that. <laughs> we have done the introductory courses in keeping bees. Wonderful. But we were worried. But we were worried about the native bees. So they do. Uh, they they live. They um, cooperate and um, they're friendly together. It's um, yeah, yeah. Look, mm -hmm. but there's all sorts of. There is you know there are some people who are native bee people and they say yep honeybees are a real issue. They're feral. But you know when you look at it, we're introduced here as well. You know. <laughs> so I think um, you know. Basically, we're all here. We all have to um, and look. The honeybees and the native bees together are fantastic pollinators. Where they're together, they're really great. So mm. we really need the honeybees. Um, you know, in terms of their numbers, you know, that many for pollination of our crops, um, and you know, your vegetables and whatever. And really, you know, I don't have that many native bees in my garden. That's the thing. I really don't. So. Um, yeah. So we've got a question from Gabriella. Thank you. I've got a big, for very big for my jungle, which is meant to be a garden gone wrong, but I've got a big rosemary bush and that's been bees all over it for weeks. And I sounds, just, what sort of bees they would be? Oh, they would be honeybees. It sounds like what you call as a jungle and a garden gone wrong is actually a haven for wildlife. And I tell you is, what, I've got the most wonderful weeds that are about, three feet high yeah 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 it, it is that time of the year it, particularly after this amazing rain we really need to take good drink up this time make sure you spend as much time outside enjoying the flowering the growth we really haven't seen such incredible growth for years it's just we grew while I looked at them. Yeah, it's wonderful. Out there and they were Absolutely while wonderful. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. All the birds will be. Yeah. So they're, 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 they'll be honeybees. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Now, I'm just thinking that Kathy hasn't got a lot. I, I just don't want to take up too much room with no, Kathy. We're just, that's just yeah. fine. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And um, right now we will go. Let's see. I've got to do my uh, thing here. We'll go to our next talk. And that talk will be presented by Kathy Amen. Kathy is a relatively recent transplant um, to Canberra, coming from a property with a tool shed to a house in O'Connor. That was the eureka moment she had of, 
why can't I just borrow a drill, not buy one? And the idea for this library of things in Canberra was born. The Community Toolbox Canberra brings excess tools and equipment out of homes and sheds and puts them into the hands of the community. And I, I've had some inside information that it's going to be opening soon. So over to you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for this sustainability uh, festival. What, what a great idea. Um, okay, so the tool library um, is something that has been in the making for a couple of years. So I first started working on this in 2019 and it has taken this long to um, secure premises. So we're operating as a project of sea change for the uh, term of our pilot, which will be 12 to 18 months. And um, so we are in the premises of Youth with a Mission, which is uh, down in Watson, um, just off the highway. And the, the basic premise behind the tool library, as Barbara said, is that we're taking the things that are languishing in people's, um, in their sheds and in their kitchens and in, in cupboards around the city that they just don't use anymore. So we know anecdotally that most drills, so you go to the hardware shop on a Sunday because you need to drill a hole or put a screw in the wall or something like that, and you buy a drill and it's easy to do and they're relatively inexpensive these days. And then you go home and you drill that one hole and then that's that's pretty well, it. you don't use it again. And so we know that um, most, most drills get about 15 minutes of use and then they are stored or discarded and you know people move and then things find their way into landfill. And it's not just drills, of course, it's also things like pasta machines and sewing machines and all manner of things that most people would only use a couple of times a year. So the premise is that we're putting a call out to Canberra saying, bring us your things that you don't use anymore and we will hold them in a, um, a fairly central pool of equipment and then members can come and borrow those things. So instead of those things being on a fast track to landfill, we are instead making sure that they have maximum use so that we're really maximizing the return on the, 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 the extracted resources from the planet. The planet does not owe us all a drill each. And so this way, one drill, many households. But it's not just drills. So already we have um, we have a drop saw, um, which I've sort of borrowed on the on the sneaky and um, made a surround for a reclaimed IBC pond that I made. Um, and we have a laminator and a dressmaker's dummy and an egg incubator and a couple of um, uh, wood chippers. So you know when you're out in the garden and you're you're trimming things, you put them through there and then into your compost. So it's a really broad, broad range. And it's anything that you could reasonably expect to only use a couple of times a year. And obviously that differs from household to household. So, you know, I've donated a lot of my excess stuff, but I'm not giving up my drill because I do use that all the time. So it's not a prescriptive thing. We're not telling people they're not allowed to own their own drill or their own anything. Um, it's really just about getting the surplus. And so we, we are starting now to get that. We had opened for donations um, a few weeks ago, and then, of course, everything came to an abrupt halt. Uh, but we're opening again from next Saturday. So from, for every Saturday, hopefully, for the foreseeable future, we will be open um, between 10 and 1, so people can, whether they have any intention of joining or not, can come and bring their excess stuff. People can also um, tell us what they'd like. So, you know, often people, you know, I've told them about stuff that we have in the tool library and they're astonished that that's a thing. So 
um, people are also invited to make requests. And so, you know, if we put out a request for say a bunch tin, which is a cooking tin that has a, a hole in the middle, um, then someone might say, oh, I've got one of those. Never thought that that would be a thing that you would want. Please take it away. So we're going to be um, largely guided by, by demand, of course. So whatever people will use, we are happy to, um, happy to stock, space allowing, of course, and things that aren't used, we'll, we'll just um, you know, give those away or sell them. Uh, so we think that there are lots of reasons why people would want to uh, participate in the tool library. Obviously, there's the environmental um, benefits. Um, there are more and more people in Canberra who are living in um, apartments, and so they just don't have the space. So every time they want, going back to the drill example, every time they want a drill, they can just come and borrow one and then they don't have to store it. They can just give it back and then it's something that they don't have to think about. Um, also in Canberra, of course, with such a, such a large number of people who come for a couple of years and then leave, they quite often come without all of their stuff and you know they don't want to accumulate a whole lot of stuff before they go again. Um, and also, I think people are, there's, there, I'm hoping that there's a real shift in, in the way people are feeling about their, their consumption. So people are more open to the idea of actually giving their consumption some thought. And so I'm, I'm a firm believer that it's not a giant leap to go from thinking, I need a, getting away from my drill example, I need a mulch fork. Uh, and for that, for the next immediate thought to not be, I'd better go and buy one, but instead, I bet they've got one at the tool library. So that's our hope. Um, also, at the beginning of the process, we did some uh, market research and we spoke to people about uh, what they thought they would want to see in the tool library and why they thought it was a good idea. And when we really drilled down into exactly what people felt was important about a, um, about a system like this, and one of the big things that it came down to was that people just want to have control over their immediate environment. So if they, if they have some gardening to do, they want to be able to just do the gardening and not have to hire someone to come with their tools and do the task. Rather, they can get the tools themselves and, and just do the thing. And so there's, there's less dependence on um, you know, people with mysterious skills and huge amounts of, um, of equipment. Um, so also one of the things that, that we found quite interesting was that people were really keen to have more of a creative outlet, which, which I suppose is not actually that much of a surprise. And there's research out there that shows that people are better if they are given a way to be creative. They are physically more healthy, their mental health is much more much more healthy as well. And in these in these times when everyone's everyone's mental health is, has really taken a bit of a knock, this as a as a resource it's where people can go and make a thing like by all means make a pond. Or if you like to try out a new a new hobby before you go and buy all of the equipment, then you know we're imagining that we will have you know equipment for um, for ceramics and for leather work and for lead lighting, you know, whatever, whatever comes to us, we will hold and people will have the opportunity to try out those, to try out those hobbies without having to do the, the outlay for all of the, for all of the equipment. Um, and I know from personal experience sort of before all of this um, sharing economy was a thing, you know, I would get an idea in the middle of the night and I simply had to try lead lighting. And then the next morning I simply had to go out and get all of the stuff and then discover that actually, no, I don't like it. And, and now I have all of that stuff and that is not unusual, I'm sure. Um, so we uh, have just had a crowdfunding campaign, which um, I'm hoping you will have at least heard of. Uh, we raised just over $16,000 uh, through that. 
And we have also very recently um, found out that we have been successful in a grant application uh, with ActuAGL. So those funds will all go together to uh, making sure that we have a really good setup so that we have uh, the software that facilitates um, volunteer management, you know, which if you've ever you know, managed a volunteer project, you'll know that getting volunteers organised and happy can be quite difficult. So we, we have that and we have some great uh, software to actually manage the, the borrowing and membership side of it. Um, we're also having a, a pretty good fit out so that everything is just going to be neat and easy to find and will just work really well. Um, and we have probably in the next couple of days, we're going to open the, um, the website for um, new memberships. So if you're one of the people who pledged through our crowdfunding campaign, thank you very much. Um, so you will in the next couple of days get an email telling you that you can now go on to our website and um, activate that membership. And so when we open, which we are very confident, COVID permitting, will be in the first week of November, um, then you can come along and start borrowing um, then and you'll be ready to go. Uh, if you haven't contributed through the crowdfunding um, and you'd like to join, then you'll have the opportunity to, to do that at the same time. Um, the membership structure, we. We really want this to be um, a highly accessible um, resource for everybody. And we want to give the people who, um, you know, who perhaps are joining mostly because of a you know, shortage of funds, we don't want to put them through the, um, through the not terribly dignified process of having to prove that they don't have the funds. So it's all um, self-selecting membership levels so we have the, the lowest level of membership is $20. Um, so for $20, you get access to everything in the, in the tool shed. So once, once you've joined, there, there's no hierarchy of membership. Everybody has the same access. Uh, then there's $55, which we recommend as a standard concession uh, membership. And then there's $95, which we recommend as a full membership. And then if you like, you can come in at a higher level as well. Uh, so also you can get onto our Facebook page, which will have announcements about all that sort of stuff. Or you can join our um, mailing list. And I'll put a, a link to our website um, in the chat. And so you can just um, follow that and, and go to our website and put your name down there. Um, so we have uh, lots of plans for the future, of course. Uh, we are very excited to be a part of what is really a quite solid community of similar projects within, within Canberra and the surrounding region. Um, you know, there are, there are several repair cafes already. There's, um, you might have, might have heard of Rosella Street, which is peer-to-peer -peer lending of, of stuff. Um, there are some maker spaces out there. There's, there's all sorts of stuff. There's, you know, buy nothing, which I adore my buy nothing group and um, street libraries and street pantries. So we are just a, a part of that, a part of the, the circular economy and the sharing economy of, of Canberra. And I think that together we have a really strong presence and that there are lots of opportunities for people to participate in their communities and to feel that they are actually living within a strong community. So having said all of that, we, we have some plans for um, other sort of add-on projects. So we'd really like to have uh, our own re repair cafe in our space. So we're down in Watson, the closest repair cafe is in um, the grounds of ANU, which is not a million miles away, but if there's nothing sort of in that corner of Canberra. So we're hoping to set that up pretty soon. Um, we're also hoping to run workshops, so to bring people in who, who know some stuff. So, you know, we might ask Julie to come in and talk to us about, um, you know, making um, B hotels 
that bees actually want to live in. And so, you know, we might have a workshop where people have a go at that or they're just getting some information or maybe we'll get, you know, experienced leather workers in and so people can just see the making. And I think that there's a real, there's a real power in being, you know, in the presence of something actually being made. And the idea that, you know, you can make something as well is, is really powerful. And there are lots of people, you know, who feel that the whole making thing, the make, and particularly the fixing thing, are not open to them. So, you know, women, people with disabilities, people with, with low funds, you know, we all are sort of given the message every day in one way or another that making is not for us and that fixing is not for us. And there's a very particular kind of person that we need to go to and they need to fix it for us. So we're, we're doing away with all of that. And so we are, you know, we want to give people some skills and the equipment and the time and just let them let them add it and be creative and have that control over their environments and, and make great stuff. Um, also on that, a women's shed. So there are men's sheds wherever you look in Canberra. I, I don't know how many there are, but there are a lot. There's one women's shed, which is south side. Um, and so we would like to set one up north side so that women can come together and make stuff, learn some, learn some new skills and make some stuff. Um, also, we're looking at having our space uh, much more accessible. So at the moment, we're in a um, we're in a demountable, so it's almost a meter off the ground, which is not great if you have um, reduced mobility. So we're looking at making that much more accessible, so that anybody can get in there. Um, and that's it. That's my talk. Great, thank you very much. Uh, oh, let me put, I gotta put back on uh, the other screen here. So, all right, well, let's let's open it up for questions. I've got one, of course, but um, I'll let, right. I'll let uh, somebody else go. Um, well, the, uh, I've heard this, uh, a previous talk, I will confess, and one of the one of the things I really liked that you mentioned was this this end of life for these tools that you you actually you actually have someone lined up already to do some repair work and to try to so that so that if you just happen to break something from the library, uh, what's going to happen um, to you? Well. Not very much, I don't think. Um, things things break. Um, we'd like to think that we're also going to be able to tell people how to use the equipment properly because often when something breaks, it's because you're, you know, not working with the tool, rather you're working at the tool and then, and then it can break. So um, these things happen. So, um, but, you know, there's there's not really very much intention that people will have to, you know, stump up for a new one, particularly since most of these things are being donated anyway. It's really about getting that circulation of things through the community. Um, we will have um, a pretty strict regimen of maintenance, so particularly the more dangerous tools, they're going to have to be thoroughly checked every time uh, they come back to make sure that they're going out and that they're safe. And so we will have people on, uh, equipped to do that sort of thing. And then also when things do come to an end of life, which is probably what you're talking about, then we will we'll strip those things back. And instead of, you know, the, the confusion that comes with the end of life, what do you do with this thing? It doesn't yeah. go in any bin that you can think of. So we will actually break those things down and then, you know, take a big tub of plastic off to be recycled and a tub of metal off to be recycled so that you know so that the end of life is as conscious um or as thoughtful as yeah. it can be yeah that's great that's great trish yes how um how, you would go out to the ywam center to borrow would you yeah. have opening hours and that sort of thing would you have employ someone to be there to manage it or 
Well, in, in the first instance, it's all going to be very much volunteer run. So the hours that we're working with at the moment are um, Saturdays from 10 to 1. And I think uh, we had penciled in Wednesdays from 3 to 6. Uh, and so they are the times when, when you would need to come. But if we had volunteers who were, you know, so numerous and dedicated that we could open every day, then we would open every day. And that's um, also it's going to be on your website if if people oh, yeah. want to volunteer, there will be a there will be a spot there. Yeah, that's right. So I think the um, the link for volunteering might already be on the website. It was only ready a day or so ago. Something went out on Facebook, I know, but uh, the link should be on the website now. So if you want to sign up to volunteer, um, please do so. And are, are people going to be able to uh, join on the spot or is that going to be or is that going to be through the website only? No, they can join on the spot. So we will, if people just turn up, then we will have a, um, a QR code that they can scan that will, will take them immediately to the, the sign up page and on the, the mobile site and they can just sign up while they're standing okay. there. Okay, great. So uh, any other questions? The um, the um, registration that would be per year, I suppose, wouldn't yes. it? That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So another thing that I forgot to mention was that there's um, going to be um, an associate membership as well. So if if somebody signs up as as a member of the the tool library and they share a house with um, other adults um, and membership is only open to adults then it's a little bit ridiculous that two people from the same household would have to both become members so the first member can nominate um, another adult member of their household as an associate member so then they their membership would be conditional on the first but it would be without charge and it would um, it, it would live for as long as the, the first um, membership was was maintained but but only one. So you know if they if they weren't living together anymore and then they were living with somebody else, as quite often happens in share houses, for example, then they could swap that over and have the the new the new flatmate as the associate member. And and if you want to donate things, you just contact through the through the email or the website. You can, or you can just um, you can just turn up. So, uh, for the next few Saturdays, for the rest of October, we're going to be down there between ten and one, and so we'll be doing sort of a contactless um, donation dance. Um, so, so just just bring it down. So, it need they need to be things that are in in good working order and um, and and you know safe and. Um, yeah, and, and things that you would only use a couple of times a year. So we're not particularly interested in things like bar fridges, for example, which are things that you just have and keep. Um, and yes, absolutely. So there, uh, someone's asking about, is it possible to see what is available? Yes, yeah, so there is a, um, there is a, a catalogue of, of things which you probably won't be able to see yet, but there will be a link from the website. Um, so you'll be able to see everything that we have. So as, as the things are coming in, that probably won't go live until, until the end of the month. Um, but as things are coming in, we're, we're putting those online. So, you know, you'll be able to search for them. There will be photographs. Uh, you, can also, um, you can also reserve things. So if, you, if, you know, if it's Tuesday and you want something on the weekend and you need a mulch fork, then you can reserve the mulch fork and we'll hold it for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Um, should, should we also be checking that before we bring our things to donate that maybe you already have three um, juicers and I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't bring them? Well, in, in these early days, we don't have three of anything. Um, 
although we do have two mulches. Um, so no, in the, in these early days, we're we're pretty um, we're pretty good for everything. And again, it, it just depends on the demand. I mean, if there's an enormous amount of juicing going on, then maybe we will want three juices. Um, but if there's not, then you know those things are, are essentially just taking up space. And we do have um, suggestions of what you can do with with those things. You know, if we for whatever reason can't take them. Um, then you know there are, we have some suggestions on what else you can do with them. So you can put them on your buy nothing site or on marketplace or um, take them to the green shed if only it was open um, and and other things like that. So yeah, not to worry, not to not worry to yet. Worry. Okay. Kathy, okay. Will you, will you be will you be there every Saturday from now on? Is this are you? Are you the main, um, you know, CEO of this? Or um, I'm. There's probably a, a core group of about four people who've been working on this pretty solidly. Um, I will probably be there every Saturday for the, you know, next six months. <laughs> um, but uh, so we're looking at, you know, once we have more volunteers and we have volunteers who are you know, really confident in the processes and, you know, they know how everything works, then then obviously we can, you know, resume our normal lives. But until then, you know, this is it. Mm -hmm. Well done. Thank you. Okay. That's that's wonderful. I think uh, we will, you'll be very busy on Saturdays where everybody's been cleaning out their sheds and I know. garage I while we're stuck in lockdown. So yeah, yeah we have a whole box. Dorothy, How many spades and forks do you have? How many what, sorry? Spades and forks. Plates and forks. We don't, we don't have any of that sort of stuff. And I'm not, I'm, I know from other other tool libraries that had a whole lot of sort of um, that kind of catering stuff that they they held onto it and it wasn't it wasn't very um, popular. But you know we'll give it a go. No, I mean spades, as in digging. Oh, gardening spades. It says it's plates and forks. Um, none. We have a hoe. Because everyone has to have their own, don't they? Really? Some people do, but some people. Don't. Some people don't garden that often. Some people only garden when their lease is up. Yeah. <laughs> there would be a need for those things that you to make the holes in lawns, you know, those Yeah, the aerators. Yes. Yeah. Have you, have you got one of those? No. Oh. <laughs> no, not yet. Mm -hmm. That's what you need the fork for, but that's a long haul. Yeah. That would take quite some time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. And thank you very much, Kathy and Julie. And uh, this has been great information. And we now have your websites, and which is a lot of um, resource for, for everyone. And I guess Tim has recorded this all. So it will be on a YouTube channel. And uh, once once it's up there, I, I'll send the uh, I'll send that link out to to both you, Julie and Kathy, if you wanna if you wanna pass that along anywhere. Lovely, thank you. So, well, thank you to everybody who is, has tuned in this afternoon. So, um, and next week it's an evening thing. Is that right, Tim? That's right, yes. Yeah. So next week, uh, we've got uh, two fantastic Canberra poets, so Jeff Page and John Fulcher, uh, and they're joining us, at, and because poetry is more of a nocturnal activity, uh, we're meeting at 7 o'clock, uh, and people will be encouraged to bring their own refreshments uh, and uh, sip them or munch them uh, as they listen to Jeff and John. Uh, we may even sneak in some jazz. I should say, we were hoping to have a jazz and poetry night uh, and so this is more of a sort of taster event, really. And as soon as we can organise something when lockdown allows, uh, we will get uh, the poets in the church and some musicians and we'll get you to come and bring your refreshments there as well. Uh, so uh, watch this space and, and uh, there we go. We'll have a, a poetry library <laughs> for people to come and take part in. But this will be on Zoom, won't it? Oh, yeah, this next week will be on Zoom. 
so it's it's you know yep saturday afternoon uh seven o'clock next week and it is the kind of the closing gala event of the online festival this year thank you too thank you Barbara.